Okay, so our scripture reading for the day uh, comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. And it read, this is from the NIV translation this morning. It reads, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends, his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? <coughs> and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost anything important? <laughs> your wallet, maybe? Your car keys? A phone number? How about your registration and proof of insurance? Or the deed to your house? I'm pretty sure most all of us at one time or another have lost our cars in a big parking lot. You know, back before you had the panic alarm that you could click and help you to find it. Back when you had to walk aisle by aisle row by row trying to find your car and trying hard to stay focused because it's so easy when you're looking over 50 cars to overlook yours especially if it's a common size and a common color it's easy to overlook i did that once at carolyn's i was just old enough to start it was actually my first road trip on my own with friends where i could drive down the interstate went to carolyn's wasn't thinking about it, went and parked my little car and went in with a couple of friends and when it got time to go, we, well, the exit was a different door. And this is back in the days when Carolyn's parking lot was full. And I got out at the door and I looked around and it was like, where'd we park? Nobody could answer the question. I was two hours late getting home because it took about that long to find the car that day. As bad, as embarrassing as that can be, how about something more important? How about like losing a child? When I was a little boy, I don't remember this, I get this story from my mother. Um, my mother loved to go surf fishing at the beach. She loved to go out and take the sand spike and cast the thing and sit in a chair under an umbrella. She could spend all day surfacing. Won't be into any crabs that she caught. On one particular day when I was about four years old, mom took me to the beach and she went down and she pulled the chair in the cooler and told me to sit in the chair until she came back. And she went and got the fishing rods and. As she starts to come back down the sand dunes, this is on the North Carolina coast. So as she's coming down the sand dunes, she looks around and she doesn't see me. Now imagine the panic. Have you ever felt that before? Her son is nowhere to be seen and there's nothing in front of her but a vast ocean. Long story short, as it turns out, Another lady comes coming down the sand dune. A lady of similar size, hair color, and build 
as my mother, and apparently I had followed her up the sand dune back to the parking lot. So here I come down, being towed by her, and can you imagine the relief that my mother felt? The joy that she felt when she realized that I wasn't lost and that I was safe and sound. Just remember these helpless feelings when we lose something we value as we talk about today's scripture reading. As Luke opens chapter 15, the setting has changed. We're no longer at the Pharisees' table. Luke tells us that tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, the, I'm told that the Greek phrase here that involves the word welcome in the text implies that Jesus may very well have been the host for this event. Okay, he may have been hosting a meal. It's not totally clear, but the wording makes it sound like that. Um, so now, in this day and time, inviting tax collectors would be a pretty bad thing to do, socially speaking. The people hated them possibly even more than they hated the Roman conquerors. Tax collectors were usually fellow Jews who collaborated with the Roman government, charged taxes, and kept a lot of it for themselves. They were viewed as traitors by the Jewish people and hated by most of the community. And this scripture verse also says tax collectors and sinners, and while we recognize that everybody were sinners, in this particular usage, it implies that these guests, these sinners, are either religious and or social outcasts. In other words, people that these Pharisees did not want to be associated with. Jesus invites everyone. He is willing and was willing to speak and to try to teach the lowest of the low members of their society. So Luke has this setting, and then he shares three consecutive parables about the lost. He opens up with the parable of the lost sheep. And it begins with a painful discovery by a shepherd that one of his sheep is missing. He loves his sheep. He's concerned. He's panicking. Polly and I lost our firstborn child, Jamie, at about the age of four years old in a Belk's department store in a mall one time. And we were also happy. For about 15 minutes, we experienced abject terror as the manager finally came along and he sent people to guard the exit into the mall and to guard the exits leading out the front doors. It took us a while. So the shepherd panics as he discovers that one of his sheep is missing. He leaves the 99 to find the one. Because he now has an altered purpose. He's not concerned about caring for the 99. He's concerned about the one that is lost. The one that needs him. And he loves that one so much that he is willing to leave the others to find it. Now, had there been any true shepherd sitting around this mill table, they may have found this a laughable parable. Because no way, if there was only one shepherd, if there was no other helper, there's no way they would have left the 99, protecting the 99 to go find one that's straight, unless he had assistance. So this is kind of like, a, you know, Another one of the situations where Jesus' story really gets their attention. Like, what? what are you talking about? He's not the one after the one. Corey Asbury, he's a faith singer. He has a beautiful song. It's, I've forgotten how long it's been out now, just a few years. It's called Reckless Love. And he describes in this song Jesus' willingness to leave the 99 to find the one. He calls that a reckless love. A love that desires nothing more than to bring the lost one back. If you haven't heard it, let me share some of the lyrics with you. 
that opened saying, before I spoke a word, you were seen over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And then the chorus and the bridge build up as he goes, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Again, if you don't know the song, I recommend giving it here. Corey Asbury, Reckless Love. So the shepherd seeks until he finds. There is no turning back. He's going into the wilderness, into the desert, wherever he has to go to track down this lost sheep. And if you think about it, it's much like if we look at where Jesus is on his journey here in Luke, he's doing much the same thing because Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. His face is turned towards Jerusalem and he's going there to be humiliated, to suffer, and to die for all of those that were and still are lost. The good shepherd doesn't calculate the value of the one sheep versus the 99. He loves the lost one, and he knows that in that moment, the lost one has a greater need than the 99. And so the scripture tells us that when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. He joyfully puts it on his shoulder. The great shepherd is joyful that his lost sheep has been found and he puts it on his shoulders to give it a restful journey as it returns back to the flock. In the belt department store that day, after a frantic search of many minutes that seemed like hours, I heard a giggle up underneath a clothing rack. Our wonderful little... Angel was watching us from under a clothing rack, essentially playing hide and seek. The immediate reaction was relief. Our child was not lost, he was safe. And the relief was immediate and profound. And I had to scratch the next couple of lines out. And let's just say it's a good thing his mama was with me that day. So the shepherd, he goes home. He calls his friends and neighbors together and he rejoices because he has, lost, he has found what has been lost. And from there, Luke goes immediately into another parable. The second parable is essentially teaching the exact same thing. And then there's a third parable that follows it, the parable of the prodigal son which we're not covering today, but again, speaking of the lost and the lost coming home. See, Luke has put these three together to reinforce the importance in this section of Scripture. Finding the loss, according to Luke, is one of the most important things that we do. And he's dedicated a great deal of space in his writing to talk about this. So we have a poor woman whose entire fortune consists of 10 silver coins, and she loses one of them. She is frantic because she has just lost 10% of everything she owns. I think anyone here who has your retirement funds invested in the stock market since the first of the year knows how she feels about that 10%, and probably then some. But see the difference here in this case, this is everything that she owns. 
We know that a silver denarius, according to scripture, is about a day's wage for a common laborer in that time period. I'm a coin collector, and I actually ordered a silver denarius. I wanted to share it with you today, but it got delayed in shipping, so I'll share it later. But a silver denarius is a little bit smaller than one of our United States quarters in diameter, and it's just a little bit thinner. To give you an idea of the kind of coin we're talking about, it's a day's wage. There are historical documents from that time period that tell us that a denarius could purchase enough grain to make about 20 loaves of bread, or it could purchase perhaps maybe six pounds of lamb. You see, in the first century, there were no banks, at least not as we think of them today. There were no places of safe deposit to put your money. No retirement funds invested in markets. No social security coming from Caesar to live on. This woman's entire fortune you could hold in your hand. Ten coins. So Jesus says, doesn't she light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. See, this coin is precious to her. It has slipped from her hand, fallen somewhere, maybe in a crack or a crevice in her floor, and she can't find it. Unlike the lost sheep, she knows it's somewhere here in my house. It didn't run off and escape. But she has lost the usefulness. She has lost the security. The buying or bartering power that that coin enabled her to have. It is lost in the dark. And so she lights a candle and she sweeps the house. And in a very similar way, the dust of sin and the darkness of unbelief hinder the Holy Spirit from finding and rejoicing over those souls that are lost. But God is always reaching out, always offering what we Methodists call provenient grace, always wanting the homecoming, as in the next parable that we're not covering today on the prodigal son. And so the text reads, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Rejoice. She's happy. She's found what was lost. She feels whole again. And Jesus reports, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. This is an invitation that Jesus' love is always there. It's always ready, willing, and able to be a part of someone's life. Once we were all lost, and we have been found, likewise, we are charged to seek for those that are lost. I want to share a story with you as I close, but before I do, I want to introduce the characters. The first character is Dr. Henry Ward Beecher. He was a famous preacher back in the, like the middle of the 1800s. He was a social reformer. He was an abolitionist, an evangelist. He was well known. His whole family was well known. His sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe. And you may recognize that name because she's the lady that wrote Uncle Tom's Cat. The second name I want to familiarize you with is, I can't read it, much less pronounce it, but a close guess is Mikhail. His name is Mikhail Pupin. He was a Serbian physicist, chemist. He was a philanthropist. He became famous because he, he got a patent on something that you engineers will be familiar with called loading coils. This patent made it possible to have long distance telephone communications. <coughs> it was because of him that you could pick up a phone in New York City and call Los Angeles. Okay, that's how valuable this patent was. Okay, so on one Sunday morning, Dr. Henry Ward, 
um, Beecher is preaching. After the service, a stranger who had come just to hear him speak, a guy in corner, you know how that goes, he, he gets cornered over here, he's going to talk to you. And he says, I counted your mistakes in English today, doctor, and you made exactly 20. Thank goodness he's not here today because he'd probably find 50 for me. To this, Dr. Beecher responded, I am afraid you are mistaken. I must have made at least 100. Now it just so happens that at that same service, in that same corner on the back <coughs> row of a pew was a young immigrant boy from Serbia. This lad was just beginning to grow into manhood. He had just immigrated from Serbia. He didn't know anyone. He didn't have any friends yet. He was alone in the great city. And he's on the back row. And many years later, he gave this testimony. He gave this testimony as the world-renowned scientist, Michael Pupin. He said, nothing so inspired me and stimulated me as those sermons of Dr. Beecher. A fault finder, a fault finder, found 20 mistakes in English, but a lonesome immigrant boy found help, hope, and inspiration. He said the one who really wants to find Christ will find him in the preaching of the gospel. And he went on to say we usually find the very thing for which we are seeking. I found my car at Carol Wins. The shepherd found the lost sheep. My mother found me at the beach that day. The lady found her lost coin. And Holly and I found our lost son. You see, when you focus on finding something, you can generally find it. And my friends, those who seek Christ, will find him. And once they do, my prayer is that they will help spread the light of Christ into the darkness of this world. I pray that they will share the light and the love of Christ with those who are sick, those who are hungry, those who are hurting, those who are addicted, those who are desperate, quite simply those that are just in bad need of being loved. I pray that we all help the great shepherds to find and to assist those that are lost. And in his holy name I pray.